Thank you for having another possibility, another opportunity to talk to you about biomarker data for hepatitis B. So, and this time, I was asked to, to um, yeah, examine whether HP, HPV, RNA, anti-HPC, and the correlated antigen are viable biomarkers. So that means, do they provide any benefit over what we actually can do? And I would first like to start with a question to everybody, what should be expected from an ideal biomarker? It should have the ability to stratify by disease stages and risk for complications as reactivation, cirrhosis, or HCC. There should be an ability to predict functional cure, HPS antigen loss, maybe ability to predict definite cure, helpful to identify treatment response before or early during treatment, and this might be especially helpful for novel treatments that are to come. And viability, does it provide benefit over current clinical practice? And this is a figure I've shown repeatedly during the last years, and it uh, shows, um, it, I add some biomarkers every year. It shows a very simple uh, HPV life cycle. The RNA is being produced here from the CCC DNA, and here all those virus, virus proteins and products that we can find in the serum, the viruses, the messenger or pregenomic RNA, correlated antigen consisting of three different targets. I will show you later what, that is, what this is, E antigen and S antigen. But the correlated antigen measures simultaneously the E antigen, the core antigen, and the P22 protein. And uh, so this is a, an assay that measures all three of them together. The RNA is believed to exist in virus-like particles, and there has been a number of studies showing that there are really different carrier, yeah, carrier structures for those RNAs. There are virus-like particles, but obviously there are also um, yeah, capsids that may be hull-free. Nobody knows whether there is a lipid hull or not. So I think this is something that has not completely been uh, elucidated. Also, the so the type of RNA that is inside of these particles may be variable. It's probably pregenomic RNA in most cases, but splice RNA might play a role here as well. The HPV transcriptional product underlies different regulations, and this is a very important point. And I have just listed to you here a couple of papers that show how these different biomarkers, they all come from CCC DNA. They all come from CCC DNA, but they underlie different regulations. So it means they can appear in the serum in different scenarios in diff at different levels, and different approaches to treat the patients or to change the environment of the virus can lower the one or the other biomarkers without lowering all of them. This is just important to know. So there are different steps here that have been described. Different here are the symbols, uh, the short names for, for those proteins, and they have activation um, function. There are splicing proteins that modify the splicing, turn it on, turn it off, and um, this is how those, yeah, those biomarkers are being regulated. And methods for quantification of serum HPV RNA, there's no validated method. There are many different methods. Most of them, well, all of them are PCR-based, but as the methods are different and as there's no validated assay uh, at the moment, the results may be variable. So there may be intertest, great intertest uh, um, differences in results, and it's difficult to interpolate from one study to another. The correlated antigen, and here is something about the test performance, is, um, yeah, it, it is uh, an ELISA. It detects the core proteins, and it's an assay that is commercially available by Fuji Rebio. But uh, if you look here, you see the dynamic range is quite low. It's an automatic test with a dynamic range between three and seven lock, and the reason is that below three lock, you frequently get you know, false positive signals or um, maybe also false, ne false negative signals, we don't know. So it's easy to dilute the serum samples to get a higher, to enlarge the dynamic range for high level correlated antigen, this is feasible, but um, until now it was impossible to get below those three locks. The kinetics of 
correlate the antigen, HPV, RNA, and S antigen during long-term treatment are depicted here, but this is just a, a scheme. This is not the, the truth. I will show you later how this can look in real life. So when you start the treatment, the DNA goes down very quickly during nuke treatment, and then RNA may follow or correlated antigen may follow, and S antigen follows at last, and once this becomes undetectable, we have achieved parafunctional cure. This is where we want to go to, and um, yeah, parafunctional or functional cure. This is the optimum what we think we can achieve at the moment. Anti-HBC, in contrast, shows reverse kinetics as compared to the other biomarkers, the natural cause. And uh, I tell you from the beginning, I did not find a lot of data I want to show you about this biomarker. It's an antibody, and it reflects control over, it somehow reflects control over the infection. So if you look at the kinetics in the long run here, then you see that the anti-HBC levels, which are here, they are lower in the immune tolerance. They increase in the, during the immune clearance phase as a reflection of increasing immune control, and they are very low in the inactive carriers, and they may um, they may have a role in reactivation. I'll come to this later. The pregenomic RNA is a marker for CCC DNA activity that has been shown. So the correlation between serum RNA and intrahepatic CCC DNA is quite high. You can see it here. This is a study from a German group. And there are other studies who have shown the same for correlated antigen. So for correlated antigen, you have to take into account here's the cutoff, but above this cutoff, the correlation seems to be comparatively high as the RNA with the CCC DNA. Um, if you look at the viral load, and this is a little bit busy, this figure here, but here in this study, um, this is a very interesting, very important study from Barbara Testoni, uh, from Italy, and they have shown here different correlations between viral load and correlated antigen. And you, said, you can see here a correlation of the correlated antigen with the viral load and e -antigen in e-antigen positives and negative patients, but not with S-antigen levels. So again, here there's a different uh, regulation of this. Um, or there are different sources of S antigen that we measure here. It is now under discussion whether a large proportion of S antigen in the negatives doesn't come from integrated genome, and uh, this is something we don't know. But this leads to the clinical performance of the marker, which is like this. So there's no high correlation with the S antigen, especially not in the E negative patients here with the correlated antigen. The correlations of correlated antigen and HPV RNA with CCC DNA they may be different, and there's one study that has looked at both of them, and they find a very similar correlation across different stages of the disease, but in E-antigen negatives, there is no very good correlation of RNA and CCC DNA um, in contrast to correlated antigen, so there might be an advantage for correlated antigen in this special setting here. The correlation of circulating different biomarkers changes during treatment. You can see here on the left-hand side baseline values, on the right-hand side week, week 96 values, and you see here the correlation values. They significantly change. On the baseline, it's always CCC DNA here, it's RNA, here it's HPV RNA, here it's S antigen, E antigen, and you see there is a change during treatment. So what we see in Untreated patient is not the same as what we see during uh, treatments and can be different during different treatments. The question is now how, much, how long do these biomarkers remain available? And this is a study we have uh, been done together with Pietro Lampertico and it will be presenting during, during this um, ASLD. We have shown it previously on ESL, a part of it. And here we look at very long treated patients up to 14 years and we have looked at different biomarkers and a part of this is uh, will be presented here, and here you see HPV DNA levels in gray from patients who have previously, uh, who were treatment naive, and red of patients who have been pre-treated, and after the first couple of years, they all go down to undetectable levels. Um, as antigen, there's no big uh, kinetic here, uh, and our, uh, HPV 
RNA levels, they can be different. So some of them, some of the patients, they have a very fast drop in HPV RNA levels, but in many of them it remains detectable and quantifiable. And if it's not detectable, it can at least be, well, there is at least a positive signal in the PCR, which is, of course, below the limit of quantification, so we cannot say how much it is, but there's something there. And so we think it's a viable marker for future studies, because if we want to use it in future treatments, it will surely be used in patients who have received nuke treatment before. The kinetics of correlated antigen are associated with response to, nu response to nucleoside analogs in monotherapy or in um, combination treatment. This is something that has been shown in 2016 by Harry Hansen's group. So whether you use it as monotherapy or with um, in combination with PEG, there is a stronger decrease in those patients who will respond. So it's an early response marker for e-antigen seroconversion in these patients. And uh, the same holds true for Entecavir treatment here. You can see this study here, RNA in Entecavir treatment. So you see a strong decrease in RNA in those who will respond. And there's uh, one study that we did to get with Gilead, and we were able to look at to look into uh, samples from a prospective randomized study, and we were looking at many markers at the same time. Here is DNA as antigen. Sorry. Oh, can, can we get that back? It's me again. Thank you. It's DNA as antigen and RNA correlated antigen and the E antigen. And you see, especially RNA and correlated antigen, they have similar kinetics, but it seems to start a little bit earlier on in RNA, the decrease. And of course, the dynamic range of this marker here is greater. So for treatment response, we can distinguish E antigen seroconverters converters by both, by RNA and by correlated antigen. RNA is a little bit earlier, but both of them work in this context here. And RNA is an early marker for E antigen seroconversion. A nuke treatment, this is something we have shown previously. So um, those patients who do not lose E, they remain uh, detectable for a very long time, and RNA is present for, as a response marker. And the same holds true for interferon treatment. Here we see a very fast decrease to undetectable levels in those patients who lose E antigen during interferon treatment. This is something we have uh, shown before, the association of HPV RNA um, and viral rebound after discontinuation of NUCs. So here it has another potentially viable indication to be measured. And correlated antigen, I, I, I skip that because it's, there's a lot of studies here with correlated antigen. I just want to highlight that um, it, uh, there, there is here a, a signal in lamivudine treatment, entecavir treatment, with and without interferon. We have shown this one. So it is a predictive marker for treatment response for either PEC interferon, nukes, or combination treatment. The Serum HPV RNA is a predictor of S antigen zero reversion, and this has been shown in a small cohort of um, Asian patients here, and it is also a marker for reactivation. So this is an interesting marker in patients who are at risk at, at um, undergoing, yeah, if they undergo immunosuppressive treatment, for example, to zero revert and to become reactive anymore. So at uh, the last few slides I will spend on experimental treatments, and you will hear, hear much more of this during the treatment. There's a lot of novel approaches to interfere with the viral life cycle, and of course every of these approaches has um, probably an effect on the biomarkers. Uh, one can imagine if you interfere with the uh, RNA directly, the RNA will go down and all the products that depend on RNA. If you use CAMs, capsid inhibitors, um, the core composition in the serum may change. Um, so this is something that is going on now, and I just want to show you that RNA levels, they are now being included and correlated antigen levels in the novel treatments here. We see treatments with an SI RNA, and you can see here the S antigen decreases and the core related antigen reduction, which is very, very strong here after a very short time. We don't know what this means yet because all those studies do not have clinical endpoints yet, so we do not know how we can distinguish between responders and non-responders, but we see very strong signals here. It's very likely that the markers will remain in the field. We see influence of uh, capsid assembly modulators. This is from Novira on RNA levels 
here, intercellular encapsidated HPV RNA. This is, can clearly be shown, so there is also an effect on this marker here. This can also be shown in patients. Here you see HPV DNA changes in dose-depending treatments and RNA changes. And you see both of those markers, they show response. They are both variable, available for this approach. And uh, interestingly, there is one study that showed that RNA decreases further um, after stopping treatment with, uh, with this uh, novel compound. And this was in, in contrast to some patients. Also, some patients have continuously decreasing HPV DNA, but remaining RNA, and others have increases in RNA again. So what is going on here? We don't know. But it can be that we have here um, a function of this novel biomarker that can distinguish one day between a functional cure or between a sustained immunologic response and some sort of a parafunctional cure that may not be associated with durably strong decreased of CCC DNA function, although HPV DNA goes down. So interesting um, to see um, risk of relapse after nucleoside analog discontinuation is associated with anti-HPC. This is something we have seen before. I just want to highlight here the levels that one has to look at. So if the level is, is above 1,000, if you have the chance to quantify anti-HPC and the level is above 1,000, it's quite safe to, to, to um, discontinue and you don't have a relapse. And if the level is lower than, yeah, the immune control may be lower and the risk is higher. And the same holds true for reactivations during immunosuppression. I just said that to you there's a novel paper out um, describing the combination of anti-HPS and anti-HPC anti together, which I'm not showing here. Quantities for differentiation of disease stages, RNA is very helpful here. This is something we have also shown in our group here. DNA is helpful, but RNA is highly significant. The difference between inactive carriers and all the active forms of the disease. The correlated antigen allows distinction between patients with mild and histologically um, advanced disease, and it's a marker for HCC. And this is a very interesting point here in this study. The correlated antigen levels, they were strongly associated with the HCC risk. This is something that really needs to be confirmed in European patients. It comes from Asia. Um, and this is uh, one of my last slides. I just want to highlight another marker which was not part of my topic. This is the composition of the S antigen, L, M, and S. And here we also see during treatment in patients who lose S antigen a very strong decrease of, um, of L and of M and a very late decrease of the, of the, of the big S. Here we see, that, we see this here. So also this marker here maybe um, a very promising approach. There is a commercial essay now out from Abbott who will be presented during the ASLD meeting. And I want to finish with my conclusion. Correlated antigen as a new viral marker may predict HCC incidence and, dis and distinct patients with mi mild and severe liver disease. It reflects CCC DNA transcription activity, may be used as a surrogate marker, but the dynamic range is low. And the RNA also reflects act CCC DNA activity, maybe not so good in the E antigen negatives. It can be a useful marker for treatment decision. It's a strong predictor for E antigen zero conversion, but there's no diagnostical assay available at the moment. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>